Hi everyone, I hope that you're staying safe and healthy during this crazy time. Um, due to unforeseen circumstances, we will be presenting about subcortical aphasia online, and so we hope you enjoyed the presentation. Subcortical aphasia is a result of an injury or lesion to one of the subcortical areas, and so these areas can include the basal ganglia, the thalamus, and the internal capsule, which are white matter pathways. And so subcortical aphasia is typically due to an ischemic stroke, which is when a blood clot blocks flow to an area of the brain. And it was previously believed that the injury resulted in aphasia. However, it is now believed that there is an indirect relationship between the injury and the aphasia. So therefore, aphasia arises due to damage in the pathways. And so there are neuronal networks where there are pathways to the cortex, and this is where the aphasia arises. So these pathways are impaired due to subcortical lesions. And so common impairments of subcortical aphasia include confrontation naming, repetition, auditory comprehension, reading comprehension, and anomia. Subcortical aphasia can be further categorized into two general types, thalamic and non-thalamic. Um, there is a range of communication impairments noted in people with subcortical aphasias, so not every patient is going to look the same. This varies based on where the lesion is, so the anatomical location and the size as well. Um, in general, we need to understand the way the information moves in the brain. Info comes from the PNS and goes to the thalamus. The thalamus then tells you where in the cortex to send the information. So a subcortical lesion is going to somehow impact one of these paths, pathways. Another thing to note is that subcortical aphasia is often misdiagnosed. For example, the lesion could be on the cortex and we're just not seeing it. So if it's too small to show up on the scan and the patient fits the profile, they can easily be misdiagnosed as having a subcortical aphasia. This is why we should take into consideration the actual symptoms that the person is showing when we're planning for treatment. So you need to treat the individual and not treat the aphasia type. Subcortical thalamic aphasia presents differently than non-thalamic aphasia. Aphasia due to thalamic lesions are more visible on imaging, resulting in being better understood and documented. The thalamus is the relay station for sensory information. There are two important nucleus in the thalamus. These consist of the dorsal medial and the lateral parietal lobe. The dorsal medial is the re relay station from the frontal lobe to the thalamus back to the frontal lobe. It is essentially how the frontal lobe talks to itself. This is commonly why an individual with thalamic aphasia will present with poor attention skills because executive functions rely on the frontal lobe. Thalamic aphasia is thought to be due to a lesion in the white fibers connecting the thalamus to the prefrontal cortex. Since the thalamus is a regulating mechanism, there will be a decrease in arousal leading to a decrease in attention. The lateral parietal lobe consists of the frontal tem temporal parietal lobes communicating to the thalamus back to those structures. When these structures are injured, the brain cannot communicate with itself. An individual with thalamic aphasia will commonly have trouble with semantic lexical retrieval, also known as anomia. More specifically, they would have trouble with less frequently used words. For example, they would be able to say guitar, but maybe not remember a harp. It is common to see agnosia in patients with thalamic aphasia too. While SLP, while speech pathologists do not treat agnosia, it is important to note the difference between agnosia and anomia. If you present a picture of a quarter and the patient cannot recall its name but still recognizes it, that would be anomia. If the individual feels the quarter and cannot tell what it is, that would be considered agnosia. Some common characteristics in thalamic aphasia would be fluent speech output, poor attention, anomia, but most likely not a severe anomia. The patient would have impaired variable auditory comprehension, some semantic paraphrases, 
and declarative memory deficits. Declarative memory is also known as explicit memory, which is the memory of facts, data, and events. The second type of subcortical aphasia is non-thalamic. This type of aphasia affects the basal ganglia. It commonly consists of tiny infarcts on the cortex that are not seen through imaging, such as an MRI or a CAT scan. This type of aphasia could present like any of the aphasias. This is because you cannot see the cortical lesion or there is a part of the brain that is not getting the blood supply it needs to function. This is called hypoperfusion. If the lesion is in the anterior portion of the cortex, the patient may experience good comprehension and slow but grammatical speech. These types of lesions lead to non-fluent speech and repetition is also affected. A posterior lesion leads to poor comprehension but fluent speech, similar to Wernicke's. While researching subcortical aphasia, um, I saw a lot of similarities between subcortical and anomic aphasia, so I wanted to include this slide showing the difference. And so both aphasias present very similarly in the fact that their naming ability is the main issue and all the other areas are still relatively intact. And so the main way to determine the difference between the two is through um, imaging of the brain and locating the area of the lesion. And so on the left side, you can see the brain of anomic aphasia. And so the lesion occurs in the angular gyrus, which is in the temporal parietal area, and it's more superior. And if you look at the second image of the scan, um, the lesion is in the right side because I couldn't find one in the left. But it gives you a good idea because it is more superior and it, on the temporal parietal, so just pretend that it's on the left side. And then so moving on to subcortical aphasia, which is on the right side of your PowerPoint. Um, this one particularly is showing thalamic subcortical. And so this lesion occurs in the thalamus and it is more inferior and medial. And so through imaging, that's the main way that you can tell the difference between the two aphasias. This is Winnie. She is a 63-year-old Vietnamese female who is right-handed. She came to the hospital with numbness in her arm and shoulder. She was lethargic with reduced awareness, um, but her blood pressure and heart rate were normal. Her numbness that she felt on her right arm and shoulder are due to the sensory strip and the parietal lobe being affected. Therefore, sensory messages are not as strong or potent, which leaves her with this numbness feeling. Um, her medical history has a no prior strokes. She has hyperlipidemia, which is a high concentration of fat in her blood, and she also has hypertension. She currently lives with her son, husband, and son's family in Philadelphia, and she has a no surgical history. This is a functional analysis we received from the SLP at the acute care in the hospital. Winnie is currently being seen at an inpatient rehab center. She presents with thalamic aphasia and this was determined through an MRI scan. In the acute phase, she presented with extreme lethargy and would often doze off mid-interaction. She also has poor level of alertness, so this is extremely important to take into consideration when moving into therapy. Although Winnie speaks fluently, she has word-finding difficulties and presents with some semantic paraphrases. Winnie is able to read at the word and phrase level, but has trouble at the paragraph level. Her repetition is also intact. Both reading and repetition can be used to promote growth in other areas during therapy. Winnie presents with declarative memory deficits. However, her procedural memory is still intact. So, for example, she would be able to do things like dress herself, cook, or groom, but she is unable to really talk about them. Or another example would be she cannot recall her son's birthday.
So after Winnie's stroke, we used informal assessments within the following first few days to evaluate her rehab readiness. According to a study done by Gadecki, greater improvement was found in patients who could attend to treatment for 30 minutes in early post-stroke recovery. So because of this research, we wanted to start with informal assessments until Winnie improved her attention. We used the informal bedside assessment, which can be found on 289 in our textbook, called the Cognitive Linguistic Evaluation. Winnie's responses were considered correct if she was able to give the response within 20 seconds of the question asked. So Winnie was able to appropriately answer the questions asked in this bedside evaluation, but she did have a slow response time. Some of the areas informally assessed were orientation and awareness, memory, problem solving, comprehension, and more. She experienced some word finding deficits when responding to questions as well. Also, because of her fatigue and attention problems, we used ice to arouse Winnie and keep her awake during the assessment. After five days in acute care, Winnie's attention span had reached 30 minutes, so she was moved to the inpatient rehab facility. So here we have Winnie's ICF model. So we're looking at how her subcortical aphasia, specifically thalamic aphasia, impacts body functions and structures, and then we're looking at how this interacts with her participation and activities. Additionally, we take into consideration the effects of environmental and personal factors. So as a result of Winnie's subcortical aphasia, she has some impairments in declarative memory. She also has some semantic paraphasias and word retrieval deficits that impact her language and communication in addition to auditory comprehension. So prior to her stroke, Winnie was very active in her community. She was a part of a book club. She loved to cook. Uh, specifically, she loved to cook with her family members and for them. And another thing that is important to note, because we'll go into more detail with it, is that she had a role at her Vietnamese Heritage Center. Uh, she was actually a volunteer coordinator there. Um, so unfortunately, her subcortical aphasia has some impacts on her participation in these activities. We are focusing specifically on the effect it has on her role as volunteer coordinator at the Heritage Center. So this is a role that requires her to be there at specific times. Uh, it requires her to interact with the volunteers and the members of the Heritage Center. She's responsible for communicating activities to the members, that uh, different activities that are going on in the community. And she needs to stay organized and on top of all of these responsibilities. So these are some of the things that we're going to keep in mind while making goals for Winnie because getting back to this position is a priority for her. So our hope and expectation is that we'll commute will improve her communication skills to the point where she's able to return to this role. Luckily, as you can see in the personal factors section, Winnie is highly motivated and she's engaged in her own recovery process. She is well aware of her deficits and day by day, she's becoming more and more motivated to turn her weaknesses into strengths. Looking at environmental factors, we can see that Winnie has a supportive family and access to services. So these are all great things that are really gonna get her in the right direction, moving towards getting back to these activities. So here we have Winnie's AFRM model, which we know covers the relationship between aphasia, specifically the severity of aphasia, personal identity, attitudes and feelings, environment and participation. So a good place to start is um, at Winnie's language and impairments related to her language. So we know that Winnie has difficulty maintaining discourse. She has semantic paraphasias. Uh, her reading is functional and it's enhanced with large print and um, she has functional reading skills for her everyday life needs. Um, as for participation, when he enjoys social activities related to her Vietnamese culture, she enjoys making crafts and cooking ethnic foods. Uh, personal identity, attitudes, and feelings. So Winnie's stroke has left her feeling very lethargic. Uh, her alertness is variable 
but we suspect that that will improve over time. Um, she is very cooperative and she is aware of her deficits, but unfortunately she appears to be indifferent to them. So it's going to be important to find things that really motivate her during therapy. Um, communication and language environment. Winnie has good social support from her family members, including uh, her son who she lives with and his family, and also from the Heritage Center. So she takes part in a Vietnamese center that has many members that she's friends with and has relationships with and many people that support her there. So during the time we were performing informal assessments with Winnie, we also were communicating with her family to help counsel them. This can be an emotional time for families of patients who have had strokes, and it's important to make sure they do not become discouraged. Family is an important part of recovery, so we talked to Winnie's family about their feelings they had following her stroke. We also asked what their goals for therapy were. They expressed they hoped for Winnie to be able to interact with her family as well as her friends at the Heritage Center. We also educated Winnie's family on her expected recovery. The first few days following Winnie's stroke would be hard, but we have seen patients with Winnie's type of aphasia improve. We also referred her family to resources provided by the National Aphasia Association. This site provides a ton of materials families are able to use to help their loved one with aphasia. So once Winnie began to demonstrate improved attention, we decided that she was ready for formal testing. Um, so the first formal test that we gave was the Click It Plus. Because of the nature of Winnie's lesion is uh, thalamic, it is expected that she would have some mild impairments in attention. This is something that has improved with time following her stroke, and we suspect that it will continue to improve. Winnie's difficulty with attention will keep be kept in mind during her treatment planning. Winnie's moderate impairments with memory can be attributed to several things. For one, memory is assessed using sto story retelling, which requires language function. This requires naming, which obviously her aphasia does affect, thus giving her a lower score. Additionally, memory is assessed using a generative naming task, which is also affected by Winnie's aphasia. So if you look at her executive functioning scores, you'll notice that there are also mild impairments here. After further assessment, it was clear her executive functioning scores were highly impacted by an extremely low score in generative naming, an area that assesses both executive functioning and naming, which again, we know that naming is impaired. Winnie scored fine in other areas that assess executive functioning, such as symbol trails and mazes. So we had an idea that her executive functioning was in task. To confirm this, we administered the Wisconsin card sort task and Winnie scored within completely normal limits. So one thing that it's important to note from this whole process of going through her executive functioning tasks and deciding if that really was the problem is that when giving an assessment with tasks that require both linguistic and non-linguistic skills to succeed, your results may not be black and white. Um, we could have given or we could have taken her results and assumed that based on them, Winnie has an executive functioning problem and then we would have focused on that in therapy and we would have been targeting all the wrong things. This would have been a complete waste of therapy time. So it's just a little reminder that you have to look at the patient as a whole and not just at their test scores. Um, to continue going through her scores, Winnie demonstrated moderate impairments in language, which we further assess using Boston naming test which Gab will go into. And then um, another thing to note is that she scored within normal limits for visuospatial skills. After reviewing the results from the Click It Plus, we decided to further assess Winnie's naming ability by giving her the Boston naming test. This test consists of 60 items, which go from common items to more complex ones. For example, the first two items to label are bed and tree, and the last two items to label are protractor and abacus. So as you can see, they increase in complexity. 
And so when administering this test, the client is allowed 20 seconds to label the item or else it is considered incorrect. However, once those 20 seconds are up, you can provide them with some sort of cue. So it can be a phonemic cue, such as B for bed, or uh, multiple choice options, which are provided to you on the back of the image. Or you can give them extra time to see if the client is then able to label the item. And this information of what cue helps the client is important to note because it can be utilized during uh, therapy sessions. So when Winnie was given the Boston naming test, she scored below average. For her age group, an average score would be between 48.7 and 57.9, and she received a score of a 45. Winnie did well with the first 35 items because they were more common. As the items increased in complexity, she began to struggle. For example, she could easily name number 12 a broom and number 21 a racket, but had difficulty with number 37 an escalator. So with number 37, she took a few seconds and then produced the word elevator. And so this is consistent with what we would expect because Winnie uh, uses semantic paraphasia. And so the response elevator is close because they both have similar functions. However, it was not the response we were looking for. After providing her with four options of what the item could be called, she selected the correct item of escalator. Occasionally, we would also use a phonemic cue, and she also benefited from that. Therefore, from the Boston naming test, we were able to determine that Winnie's naming abilities are impaired when dealing with more complex items, and that it would be useful during therapy to give her options or a phonemic cue if she is struggling to name an object. So here we have a list of Winnie's strengths, which lucky for her, she has a ton of them. Um, even upon initial evaluation, even when her attention wasn't great, she demonstrated a great deal of strengths in both linguistic and non-linguistic functions. She is functional, she is within functional limits for automatic speech, repetition, syntax, speech intelligibility, and articulation. Winnie does have some paraphasias during conversation or fluent speech. We suspect that these will improve as Winnie becomes less lethargic and more alert. On this slide, you'll see a continued list of her strengths, uh, looking at reading, written expression, and cognitive skills. Uh, Winnie is within functional limits limits for reading comprehension at the word level. She is also within functional limits for copying text. Winnie is able to write to dictation, so if you tell her to write, she can write exactly what you're saying. However, there are some paragraphic errors. She is also able to self-generate writing within functional limits for the needs of her everyday life, which is a really great skill to use to improve her communication. Winnie's vin Visio-spatial skills are functional, but they're further enhanced with the use of large print and pictures, something that will definitely be kept in mind during treatment planning for therapy. So although Winnie does have a lot of strengths, she also experiences problems in the following areas. Her language expression is moderately impaired. She uses semantic paraphasias on occasion for items that are less common in everyday activities. So for example, she might refer to a helicopter as an airplane. On top of this, her speech is slow and hesitant. And Winnie also has reduced intonation, which makes her sound very monotone. This could be caused by her lethargy. When looking at Winnie's diagnostic weaknesses, we found that she does not have any that are super severe. However, we see more of mild deficits. This is still important though to take into consideration in therapy. Winnie's auditory comprehension levels are mild to moderately impaired. She is able to respond to yes, no questions, able to execute one step commands, and she's able to really understand stuff at the sentence level. 
However, when it comes to listening to like a story or a long conversation, we might see impaired comprehension deficits. When it comes to reading, Winnie has moderate trouble with reading at the sentence level and paragraph level. However, she is able to read at the word and phrase level. When she reads aloud, it is a little slow and labored. And in her spelling, we commonly see errors in commonly used words. This could be um, because of her declarative memory deficits. We assessed Winnie's cognition by looking at her attention and memory. So Winnie's attention slash concentration were poor immediately following her stroke. For example, after saying her name to gain her attention, she would hold it for five seconds and then either become disinterested or tired. And so this was an area of concern for us because we know that having difficulty with attention affects all areas of cognition. And then after monitoring her for a week post-stroke, she can now attend for up to 30 minutes, which is a great improvement from when we first saw her. In regards to her memory, we found that her declarative memory is impaired. And so declarative memory are facts that can be easily recalled. So that could be um, knowing when her son's birthday is or what time her favorite restaurant closes. However, Winnie's brain cannot access her declarative memory. And this is a non-linguistic function. However, it can impact linguistic functioning such as naming. So that's why we want to keep an eye out on this and uh, possibly target it during therapy. But on a more positive note, her procedural motor memory is intact. So this can be utilized during therapy. We also looked at Winnie's behavioral symptoms. She presented with extreme lethargy and poor level of awareness upon entry. For instance, she would frequently doze off mid-conversation. However, her level of awareness has increased since we saw her a week later after um, monitoring her continuously. And um, she's also aware of her receptive and expressive deficits, but appears to be indifferent to them. Following the Click It Plus and Boston Naming Test, we were able to create Winnie's ALD target model. As you can see from the image, her non-linguistic skills of attention, memory, and executive functions are impaired, while her visual spatial skills are still intact. Her language abilities of reading, writing, expression, and comprehension are mild to moderately impaired. So now we'll be moving on to Winnie's treatment goals that we kind of thought about when we looked at the ICF model and we talked to Winnie and we talked to her about what is most important and functional for her to live her daily life. One of the deficits that's more severe with her is her declarative memory. So declarative memory really refers to like the facts and personal events that can be consciously recalled. So for example, it could be Winnie getting on, remembering to get onto the bus to go to a heritage center, which we discussed in the ICF model. She might be able to know how to get to the bus, how to get on the bus, how to get to the heritage center. However, she might not be able to recall how, when she goes to the heritage center every Wednesday, what time she gets on the SEPTA bus because she's from Philly. So she told us that she... She can't remember what time she's able to do this, and she really wants to be able to go there and be on time, be ultimately self-sufficient. Um, so we decided to figure out a goal for her. So her long-term goal is when he will improve declarative memory to participate in activities of daily living. And her short-term goal is kind of help her with this. Winnie will use space retrieval to recall facts necessary to maintain her daily schedule. And another short-term goal is Winnie will use large word cards to compensate for her declarative memory deficits. And we plan to have treatment two to three times a week for 30 minutes. <clears throat> it's important to remember that Winnie's procedural memory is still intact as she is able to carry out familiar tasks without consciously thinking about them. However, we will be introducing space retrieval, which is an evidence-based memory technique that uses procedural memory to help people recall information over progressively longer intervals of time. In space retrieval, we thought this was the best because you need to choose what is a functional goal 
for the client and what is important for them. As we were researching therapy techniques for, de for improving declarative memory, we came across space retrieval. Um, space retrieval really is improving recalling information for a client. And we thought that this would be best for Winnie because she has deficits in recalling important information. So for example, she goes to the Heritage Club every Wednesday afternoon. And she has done this for over 10 years. But ever since her stroke, she has trouble remembering what time she gets on to the SEPTA bus in the afternoon, as this has always been intact in her memory, but she cannot recall what time she gets onto the SEPTA bus. So when we looked at the ICF model, we saw that she really wants to participate fully in her Heritage Club, but to do this, she needs to get there, and she wants to be as self-sufficient as she can be. So... The first step in space retrieval is you want to identify the functional goal, desire, or need. In our example, the functional goal is to, for Winnie to recall the time that she needs to get on the SEPTA bus in the afternoon. You would then develop the lead question to elicit a response. For example, I understand you have a hard time remembering what time to get on the SEPTA bus in the afternoon to go to your heritage club. What time do you get on the SEPTA bus in the afternoon? Winnie responds, three. If this is correct, you would wait 15 seconds. And then when the answer is given correctly, you would double the interval time. So for example, you ask her the question, she gets it right, we wait 15 seconds. You ask her again, you then double it and wait 30 seconds. You can um, double the interval time as many as you would like to see when the client masters the goal. If the answer is incorrect though, you would give them immediate feedback and give them the correct response. You would then go back to the last time, the last interval, they got it correct. In between intervals, clinicians and clients can work on another activity, whether this is bingo or maybe something the client enjoys. It is important to remember and use your clinical um, judgment when you think your client may have mastered this goal. They say that usually in the span of three sessions, then you would be able to move on to another functional goal. So if we were moving on to another functional goal, it could be Winnie remembering her son's birthday, which she has expressed to us that she is unable to recall her son's birthday. And this is really important to her because she lives with her son. Her son is really means a lot to her. Our second treatment goal um, focuses really on Winnie's verbal communication abilities so she can express her wants and needs and increase her social interactions. So the long-term goal we decided was Winnie will improve her verbal communication abilities so she can express wants and needs to unfamiliar communi communication partners in the community. And the short-term goals are Winnie will increase her ability to retrieve words through semantic feature analysis with 80% accuracy. The other one was Winnie will identify five attributes per picture of a familiar item with one to two verbal cues from the clinician with 80% accuracy. The semantic feature analysis is really to help Winnie with her anomia. Um, and in the next slide, I'll talk really about what semantic feature analysis is and why this will be an appropriate therapy technique for Winnie. We chose semantic feature analysis in hopes to improve Winnie's word retrieval. We found this in a study done by Mary Boyle, and semantic feature analysis focuses on the meaning-based properties of nouns. It helps to generalize words, improve word finding, and spread activation for semantic mapping. When you do semantic feature analysis with a client, you're kind of teaching them a compensatory strategy such as circumlocation or circumlocution, which is really when you're, they talk around a word in hopes for their communication partner to understand them a little bit better if they cannot find the word. 
So in semantic feature analysis, we look at six features that can be used to describe the noun. So there's group, use, action, properties, location, and association. We chose to use a can opener because in the ICF model, we talked about how Winnie goes to her heritage club and she loves to cook and participate and socialize with her friends. So we just chose the can opener because she really has trouble with less frequently used words and this might be a less frequently used word in the kitchen. So for example, we said that a can opener is a utensil. Winnie uses it to open canned goods and for cooking. She said that it twists and opens cans. It's made out of metal and you can find it in the kitchen. It reminds her of cans, tuna fish, beans, and maybe some other things. If the patient cannot name it, even after reviewing all these features, it is important to provide the correct response, request verbal repetition, and then review the features again. For our last treatment goal, we decided to work on auditory comprehension. Although it is only mild to moderately impaired, it is still important to Winnie that she improves her auditory comprehension. When we talked to her through the ICF model, she expressed that she loves to social interact with people, but feels like when she's in a long conversation, she has trouble comprehending some people. So for a long-term goal, we decided Winnie will increase auditory comprehension to engage in social interactions with a communication partner. Her short-term goal will focus on um, her answering questions about a short story. So Winnie will answer four out of six questions about a short story given to her by the clinician with verbal cues. This goal will ultimately help Winnie engage in conversations to her full potential and hopes to have her be able to listen to maybe her grandchild talk for a really long time or be at her heritage club and be able to sustain long conversations with her friends and family. Okay, so here we have our critical thinking questions. Um, so I'm just gonna read them out and then it will give you something to think about and discuss with each other. Uh, so number one, we want you guys to discuss different ideas for therapy activities that would involve targeting declarative memory. Number two, what information that we presented indicates that Winnie has thalamic aphasia? Number three, the preservation of repetition in thalamic aphasia is similar to what other type of aphasia? Number four, we talked about the many strengths that Winnie has. These include reading, self-generative writing, and fluency. So how will these strengths be beneficial and help Winnie compensate for her deficits? And then a reminder, her deficits are auditory comprehension, naming, and memory. And then number five, a major side effect of subcortical aphasia is decreased attention and extreme lethargy. While most of these symptoms have improved, Winnie still shows symptoms of decreased attention and lethargy. It's definitely not as bad as it was in the beginning, but they're still there. So what, why is this important to keep in mind when you're planning for therapy?